Christmas. Good evening to you all. Very warm welcome to our worship service. We remember you will be looking on and joining us uh, later on in the recording of the sermon, God willing. We hope to be live streaming in the very near future, thanks to um, those involved on the ground here, um, making the arrangements with our internet provider. So God willing, we'll be back online uh, live services soon. But shall we worship God this evening? We're going to sing firstly Psalm 89. First three singings, we're singing from this Psalm 89, Scottish Psalter, and this is page 344, verses 1 to 5, 89 verses 1 to 5. It's often thought of or known as a covenant Psalm where God makes amazing promises to King David. Back in the book of Samuel, we're going to sing verses 1 to 5, God's mercies, I will ever sing. And with my mouth I shall thy faithfulness make to be known to generations all. For mercy shall be built, said I, forever to endure. Thy faithfulness, even in the heavens, thou wilt establish sure. Let's sing verses 1 to 5, Psalm 89. God's mercies I will ever sing. God's mercies I will ever sing. And with my mouth I shall Thy faithfulness make to be known To generations all For mercy shall be built, said I Forever to endure Thy faithfulness even in the hands the wilt establish I with my chosen before the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's seek God together in prayer. Lord our God, we thank you for these words. You are a faithful covenant-keeping God. That you entered that sovereign relationship with David, who you chose from feeding the sheep and tending the flock, to become the shepherd of your people Israel, the leader of your people and the promises that you made to him they're so so amazing they're so almost in some ways unbelievable the terms that you use and the commitment that you make to fulfill your plans and your purposes 
not only with David, but also with David's descendants, and how in that amazing psalm you'd mention that even if David's descendants would go astray, like Solomon clearly did, you said, I'll not take my love from him, nor yet, nor false, my promise make, my covenant I'll not break, nor change what with my mouth I spake. Lord, if it was up to us, if our standing with you was based on our own merit or faithfulness to your promises and trying to keep and them and trying to serve you, we would have nowhere to stand or hide. We'd be written off. And when we see what you said to Moses about the rebellious Israel, when you told Moses to leave you alone until you wiped your people away and would make a new nation out of him. And he said no. And you were saying that to test, no doubt, and to express to Moses your indignation and anger that these people that you had chosen, those whom you had brought out of Egypt through the wilderness after the Red Sea, miracles, and then they came to Mount Sinai and where Moses was with you on the mountain and you were so very clearly and like Hebrews 12 describes the very tangible, audible, and visual, sensory realities of your presence at Mount Sinai. We're told that Moses said, though we don't read it in Exodus, we read there in Hebrews, Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And for all of that, the symbolism, the obvious symbolism of your presence and power where the whole earth round Sinai, the land was shaking, then at God's presence shook the earth. Then drops from heaven fell, this Sinai shook before the Lord, the God of Israel. But at the foot of the mountain, the Israelites, your people, they rebelled. And they got so impatient. And they got so impatient with you because they got impatient with Moses, who'd been on the mountain receiving that amazing communication from you and receiving the law, the terms of the covenant that you would make with your people. That if they kept these terms and obeyed your laws, they would be blessed. And if they failed, what would happen is they would lose the land they were about to inherit. And they would be taken into another land that wasn't theirs. And so the promises were later so clearly fulfilled with the downfall of Jerusalem, the end of Second Kings, and the exile that we read of, the taking away of your people to Babylon under the Babylonian Empire. Lord, you haven't in any way not kept your promises. Some people might have complained or looked on and thought that the exile was indicative of the fact that you had abandoned your people. But Daniel, your servant, he ex understood and he experienced the blessing and the subsequent prayer that he had when he read in your servant Jeremiah's writings that you had said the exile would be for 70 years. And so he prayed. And amazingly, with the moving of sovereigns and the kingdoms existing at the time from the Babylonians to the Medo-Persians. We read of a great Cyrus as well in Isaiah and other places. One who you call your anointed and your chosen who would go before you. And you said these many years before he was even born that he would serve you though he didn't even know you. What an encouragement. And a challenge to our faith and our expectations when you are able to accomplish, as we see, you're able to do anything, but when you see, we see that you have chosen to accomplish and fulfill your promises to your people in sending them deliverance through those who aren't your people at all, but are so fulfilling your eternal purpose and plan, the terms of your covenant, that it's as though they know you and are obeying you. And then we see how your people came back to the land and how the 
The temple was rebuilt on a much smaller scale, but with far greater blessing to come than the vast structure that Solomon had built. And the walls of Jerusalem then were rebuilt, and your people adopted a, a new beginning. And you said to them that the glory of the latter glory, the glory of the latter house, the second house, the temple would be greater. And so it was, especially when your son came. And when John said, we have seen his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And not only that, as the wonder and the admiration and the adoration of seeing such a gracious, such a loving Savior, but to, as John goes on to say, and of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Like the waves of the sea, Lord, coming over us constantly, supplying our needs, sustaining us. And if it wasn't for your covenant commitment and love, or as the Old Testament describes it, the old Bible, the loving kindness, or what we read of your steadfast love, were it not for you. As you say in Malachi, I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. If you change like us, as we change so often from day to day and sometimes moment to moment without being consistent, we thank you, Lord, that like we read in First Samuel, you're not a man that you should repent. You're not someone who changes your mind depending on circumstances. You're not someone who says you will do one thing and you choose to do the other. You see the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel with Elijah and they're doing everything to summon Baal, not realizing they're so powerless. And the Baal they're seeking to worship is Satan. And they lacerate themselves, they cut themselves in a frenzy. And your servant Elijah is looking on and somewhat mocking, telling them, cry louder. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's away. All the time knowing the powerlessness when face to face with the living God. But we are asking, Lord, that this evening as we seek you, that we would come to that place, indeed further than the place the Israelites came to on that occasion, when Elijah called the fire down from heaven, where the prophets of Baal couldn't call or summon the demons to ignite the fire on their sacrifice. Elijah prayed, and you sent the fire down, and then the Israelites were told, they fell on their faces, and they said, the Lord, he is God. And so, Lord, for all of our hearts to be turned to you, to say that and to know that. And like John said at the end of his gospel, we've written these things so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ. We pray that that will be true for us, not just to know about you, but to have that personal relationship with you where we come to know you for ourselves. Remember us here tonight, all the families we represent and all the situations we represent. We come before you, Lord, as a gathering, a congregation, praying for our extended church family, those who cannot be here and haven't been able to be out for a long time. You think about this place, those in loneliness and felt isolation and any struggling with your providence and sinking into themselves and withdrawing. We Pray for them, Lord, that you will grant your blessing and that liberty of the Holy Spirit that is able to release our thinking and our feeling from being negative and restrained and hemmed in and negative to being free and heavenly. Lord, that we may feel that you breathe into us like you breathed into Adam. And he became a living being. And when you, as it were, through your spirit, as Jesus, your son, did, in the upper room, we're told he breathed on the disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. They were disciples already. And we need, Lord, desperately that reinvigoration, that personal revival and that strengthening with might 
by your spirit in the inner person. Even as we meet just now, we know this to be so through us. We often say it and think of it more than we say it, but you have said in John 15 about the vine and the branches, that in our dependence on you and our need of you, apart from you, without you, we can do nothing. And so grant, Lord, the strength, the blessing to be engaged in and involved in this act of worship, that you will be so near and real to us that we are aware of your presence and seeking to worship the God who is in our midst and to be able to, as the Philippians were reminded, that the Christian is the tr belonging to the true circumcision. The heart has been changed. And he says there to them, he says, we worship God in the spirit. Lord, that we know this tonight, that we know this in our daily lives, that divine dynamic and power that changes people through acts. I was about to read part of that book of how even Christians can be changed and to be filled with, as the chapter ends, filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. May we know something of this, even now, that heavenly exhilaration, living in a fallen world that is filled with darkness and death and disintegration and decay and divisions among nations and within nations and the false dream of a multicultural society and integration of people of, especially where people come with a, a set religious ideology that has nothing but global domination as its goal and our leaders foolishly think and we know of some prof uh, not well it wasn't prophets but politicians even in the past who who weren't christians but may even have somewhat prophesied without knowing it that such a mixture of peoples and religions will never work not that we cannot coexist in one way, but integration of a certain religion will involve that religion having to be abandoned. The rise, Lord, of Islam, and when our government will talk about moderate and militant, they don't know what they're saying. And we love our Muslim friends. Some will have colleagues, neighbors, and how a joy to welcome, Lord, those who need new homes and to be welcoming to families who are in need and those we think of maybe who've le left, fled from Syria or other places to find a new beginning. What, a, what a, a, an amazing thing for people to feel at home in that way. But where there's an organized and a determined flood of people coming in who are economic uh, seeking that economic stability and even in their religion look upon the government state handouts as being what they deserve in their religion as the the infidel or the or the ungodly paying them to take over their land sounds maybe so extreme but lord as we look into your word and consider these things we pray for wisdom and uh, seek your blessing upon our people and upon our nation and upon the continent we're part of and upon the whole world. Praying, Lord, that your great power and glory will be revealed, that the nations will know you in an even greater way. And you are speaking to the world. You always have been and you always will, but in ways sometimes the problem, always really the problem is always with us. It's not that you aren't speaking, it's that we're not listening. And your kindness and your grace and your patience and long-suffering by not intervening or dealing with the world as it deserves, your patience came to that, came to that place of not that you were ever impatient or that your patience ran out, we don't mean that, but with Sodom and Gomorrah, 
the time came and you spoke to Abraham in such human terms that you and the two angels came down from heaven to see whether the cry of the city was altogether as it sounded. You've given them so long, but the time came for the judgment. Lord, to think of the pride and the arrogance and the rainbow flags, the defiance of the colors that you've put in that glorious symbol and reminder to us that can revive and refresh us to see the rainbow in the sky. And sometimes when we've maybe struggled to find you in prayer or in the reading of your word, and there the rainbow speaks, just about the exact same reality that we are singing about in Psalm 89. Because you said there to Noah that you will bring your bow into the cloud, uh, into the sky. You, the bow and the cloud will be in the sky. And you will see it. And you will remember your covenant. And so, Lord, the thought that when we look at the rainbow, you're looking at it too. And it's a reminder to us of your faithfulness. But how satanic that this glorious reality has been stolen and distorted and made into something blasphemous. Others may say it's just a coincidence that these are the colors, the rainbow flag. But we know that Satan takes everything that is yours and everything that is heavenly and everything that is glorious. And he will distort it. He will destroy it. He will defile it if he possibly can. But you reign. And your patience, Lord, with our nation, with our leaders, with our society. At times is shocking. But at the same time, it makes us think what's coming. And the days that we're living in with our children are growing up with massive opposition against their very humanity. Where ideologies of self-mutilation and destruction of one's identity. Where we rebel against who you've made us. And we're doing exactly the thing Exactly the thing when Paul describes that we are from the Old Testament that we are the clay and you are the potter. And the audacity of the clay saying to the potter, what have you made? What are you doing? What have you done? The blasphemy, Lord, of challenging you. All of these things help us to be wise. Help us to see what's happening. And for our people, Lord, and all who are caught up in this, to see the satanic motivation that is behind this whole movement. You, Lord, made man, man and woman, woman, male and female, in the image of God. You made the distinction, and now at the very essence of that distinction in creation, people are trying to force children and parents being in some places anyway forced or the attempt is to force them into silence and submission and not allowed to say this or that or being forced to call someone by what isn't true effectively we're being challenged to tell lies that a man is a woman or that a woman is a man when it's never possible no matter what but help us as your people you know Lord we pray for those who are caught up and who are confused about their own identities and how many people and we've seen of some who have lived to regret terribly the damage they've done to themselves and the impossibility of undoing all of this transition and physical things they've gone through but we do pray lord we pray for those who are in need we pray for those who are confused and pray for your word to bring that light and clarity so help us May we have the opportunities that we don't mean to condemn or judge or criticize, not that, but the ideology and the spirit behind it, that we'd be seeing this and that we would realize it's a spiritual reality, not simply a man-made ideology, but a very dark religion. And as we meet tonight around your word, Lord, we're going to meet someone who was a magician and someone who did everything to try and prevent the power of the gospel coming to Cyprus and coming to someone who was important in leadership in that place. But the blindness came down 
and that man was unable to see. You've vindicated your name and glory and didn't let anyone stop you. We pray, Lord, to see this in our time, that we may be used by you whatever small way you may choose, even in this, not even as though it's a small way, we don't mean that, but sometimes it can be a, a restlessness and wishing to have the ability to do something and feeling so powerless, but it is our calling, it is our privilege to pray, and to reach to the God of heaven and to pray for your intervention. And as in Isaiah 64, that you would rend the heavens and come down. So Lord, we look to you in our need. We don't look at anyone in, from a perspective of felt superiority or like the Pharisee in any shape or form. We confess our sins, Lord, and if you were to mark them against us, we couldn't stand. We couldn't stand. And your forgiveness is astonishing. Your loving kindness is amazing. Help us tonight that as we opened with that verse, first verse in Psalm 89, that we've said God's mercies, I will ever sing. May we sing through our experience and through the power of your spirit with that realization of what this means. That your mercy, which endures from age to age, is an expression of your amazing love and grace to people like us. Focused in your son, he is the one who embodies, he's the one in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. He is the one who is the brightness of the Father's glory, the express image of his person, the one who said to Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. O Lord, our God, may we see the glory in Jesus and may we come to love and adore him and to serve you. So bless us, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue in this same psalm, Psalm 89, and this time verse 13. It's Scottish Psalter once again, 89. It's page 345, Psalm 89 and verse 13. Thou hast an arm that's full of power, thy hand is great in might, and thy right hand exceedingly exalted is in height. Justice and judgment of thy throne are made the dwelling place. Mercy, accompanied with truth, shall go before thy face. We'll sing down to verse 17. This is Psalm 89 at verse 13. Thou hast an arm that's full of power. <coughs> Thou hast an arm that's full of power, thy hand is great in might, and thy right hand exceedingly Justice and judgment of thy throne are made the dwelling place. Mercy accompanied with truth shall go.
such strength doth only stand in thee and in thy favor shall I fall and part exalted be. It's turn to read from the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and we can read the whole chapter together. Acts 13, verse 1, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for that's the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has promised to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No. But behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they do not recognize him or understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfill them by condemning him. 
And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so on. May God bless his word at reading to us and help us in our meditations on it well let's turn back to psalm 89 scottish psalter psalm 89 and page 346 346 we begin at verse 24 and we can sing to verse 28 my mercy and my faithfulness with him still yet shall be and in my name his horn and power men shall exalted see his hand and power shall reach afar i'll set it in the sea and his right hand established shall in the rivers be. Down to verse 28. Let's sing from verse 24. My mercy and my faithfulness with him yet still shall be. My mercy and my faithfulness with him. Oh, God. 
back to a reading in, in the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles 13, and let's read again verses 32 and 33. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son today. I have begotten you. One of the things that really stands out in the book of Acts is the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to think, to realize that we cannot, like Jesus said in John 3, see him. The work of the Spirit, he says, is very much like the wind which comes from one place and goes to another. And with our eyes, we cannot actually see the wind. We can see where it's present by what its effects are. Jesus says, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. There is mystery. And there's mystery because there's sovereignty. And by sovereignty, it is God's rule over everything and over everyone and over every situation. And also in the church. It's a challenge to us. You think of challenge, you're so often thinking of that word today and in the, in the sense of being face-to-face -face maybe with the teaching of, of the Bible and God's Word and having to confront ourselves with it. Um, not so much to change our maybe beliefs if, or, if they're out of, out of sync with what the Bible is saying, but to embrace these teachings as having an application for our lives. R reading in the book of Acts, should we be looking back at how the church was in its glorious days and say to ourselves, well, that was because it was. It was wonderful, glorious, amazing. Or should, as others have said, maybe it's the other extreme, but along the right lines for sure, that the book of Acts is, well, some would say it's like a blueprint for how the church should look in every age and generation. How should worship look? How should prayer look? How should evangelism and outreach look? What does revival look like? What does persecution look like? What does conversion look like? All of these many different things. Well, we look in Acts the book of Acts, and we see these very things. But it is filled with mystery. You see in verse, uh, the beginning of chapter 13, the church in Antioch, there's three locations referred to in this chapter. The first is, is Antioch. And uh, again, to visualize what's happening, it's very difficult with words unless, um, which may, maybe some, some are, of course, uh, well-versed, as it were, or experts in, in the geography of the land. So when you hear of Antioch, and then you hear of Antioch in Pisidia later on in the chapter. You know it's not the same place. And in the middle of it all of the two places, you have the island of Cyprus. And one way to think about the first Antioch is to, I think the children can do this, you get to look at a map of the Middle East or the Bible lands or the land in Bible times. It's like Cyprus has a finger, the way its outline is. And it's pointing. You see what I mean if you have a look at it. It points towards Antioch in Syria. Just think about Syria. Everything we know about or hear about that's happened. And here this situation in the beginning of chapter 13. The sovereign moving of the Holy Spirit is happening in that very land. It's a thought, isn't it? That the gospel had such power and influence in some of these places before. Sometimes people look for a global awakening that will lead to every nation being converted and Christianized. People look at it in terms maybe of a, a millennium or the glory that's coming and um, with, with different aspects to it. And, and um, 
that is, that, that is a hope that, that a lot of people have. But what, what, you, what you notice, I think, historically, is that the gospel moves from place to place. I don't believe God has ever said the world is going to be Christianized. Some people have an approach that involves, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a positive aspiration when you think of it, where some Christians who would look at the reconstruction of society top down so that all aspects of, of a society are Christianized and um, so the arts and the sciences and education, everything will one day be completely Christianized. It's all maybe built into that idea, but history shows us that God's dealings always with a remnant and that he does, well, the, 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 the glorious presence of God will fill the universe one day a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And it's there Isaiah is referring to us. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a thought. Everywhere in the whole world will be filled with the recognition of the presence and the knowledge of the Lord. He, he we're told in Revelation, is the temple. There's no need of any location that in that environment the presence of God being everywhere is as it were the temple but what we find <clears throat> happening throughout history is the gospel moves from place to place even what we read of here when the word comes to Antioch and Pisidia the word goes and Paul says it's in accordance with God's plan we're going to the Gentiles the Jews reject it and say okay we're, we're going not only we're going, but the, as Jesus said, they shake the dust off their feet. It's like we're done. Now that sounds so serious, and, and it is. And, and when you take history and, and God's dealings in, in, in the past and see it maybe in that light, he moves from place to place. You think, well, why, are, why, are, you know, why have things changed where we are? Why is it that other parts of the world may experience blessing when the Western world is declining massively, rapidly, like on a roller coaster? The church and Christians can feel so powerless. And when people in power and in influence and authority are, are almost becoming the thought police, and the police are wasting resources on what you say on Twitter and all of that kind of stuff, you're not allowed to say or think anything anymore unless you're told. And even when it comes to pronouns and even when it comes to whatever you want to say, we are told. And the education of these, it's almost we're... It's to program people to think the way certain people want you to think, way up the chain, as it were. And they want people to uh, adopt a completely uh, ungodly approach to life, a bit like this, um, what's he called? Uh, this, uh, the Jewish false prophet called Bar-Jesus. His, 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 the meaning of his name, verse 8, tells us is Elymas, the magician. He's doing everything he can to stop you might think of someone who's in the council, a very important person, a, a representative of the government, an MP. And there he wants to listen to the gospel. And then he's got this other person doing everything in his power to distract him and to prevent it. It's the times we might find ourselves living in. And, and like this, it's, the thing, it, it's, it's, it's one thing for us to say things have, have, have happened like this, almost a cyclical way. We can see that in the book of Judges. There is a pattern providential pattern you see that God blesses the people the people rebel God sends judgment from an invasion from a foreign army then the people cry and he raises a judge think of Samson think of Deborah think of Jephthah think of these people that God uses to rescue his people and then the cycle happens over again it's somewhat predictable and then we'll say there's nothing new under the sun but there there are the new things under the sun and there will be newer things under the sun and things the like of which have never to their degree happened before. But how do we feel looking at the book of Acts? Hopefully we're inspired. It's an account of not so much what the apostles did, but as in chapter 1 Luke says, as first, this is a, a book written to a certain Christian man he called Theophilus, a man whose name, maybe it's, maybe it's a name that's given, maybe it's his actual name. But his name means he's a man who loves God. Imagine having that name, having that reputation. Wonderful. But Luke says in the chapter 1 of Acts that in the first book, 
he wrote about what Jesus, and it's this key word, began to do and to teach, which means Acts is a continuation, it's part two, of what Jesus continues to do. But now he does it from heaven, by the Holy Spirit, through his apostles. So it's really the acts, the works of the Holy Spirit through the church in the world, the glorified Jesus. Again, we thought of it the other day when, when in chapter one, they're praying for, a, to, for the replacement of Judas in the apostleship. And Peter, you can see them, they're praying. They're praying to the Lord. They know he's there. He is real to them. And it's a conversation they're having. And they're asking the Lord to show them which one he has chosen. Which is very similar to that in, in, in the opening of this 13th chapter as well, where we meet um, the church in, in Antioch. The church, what do you think of this? The Lord was so there. There were prophets in that church. The people who, had, who God called and commissioned to have their finger on the spiritual pulse of things. You know what a thought that is. Where they're in tune, as it were, with God. And he speaks to them. And they know he's speaking to them. They know he's guiding them. And among them, we're told there is Barnabas, verse 1, Simeon, who was called Niger. And that name, it just from the Latin, it just means black. The word that's used and thrown around these days. Well, this is back then from the Latin. That's, that's just the name that was meant of this, the, the, the name that applied to this man showing his skin color. Not a problem. It shouldn't be an issue. But um, I remember somebody, it was actually at a general assembly, it's a, and this is just by the way, a late minister, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't um, pronounced the way it would be pronounced here in the Bible, but he was pronouncing it in the wrong way and caused a bit of upset in the assembly. It shouldn't have. The man was just making the mistake. It was, as you'd say, the N-word that was being pronounced. Instead, I mean, and it's, it's, it's neither here nor there because we know what the man was meaning. It just means the same thing. No intention was made. But anyway, there's the word. There's one of these men, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manain. Notice he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, the man who had John the Baptist executed. And the man who Jesus stood before, silent. Imagine growing up with someone who became a king. And you become a Christian. And you become a prophet. You know how it can happen? Growing up, friends, same background, same education, and go completely different ways in life. It's a wonderful thing to see that there's no one. With, you know, to think of, think of Herod. Herod feared John the Baptist. Herod had an inquisitiveness. Herod Antipas, that is. He had an inquisitiveness. He heard John the Baptist gladly. We're told about Jesus. He wanted to see him do some sign. He had an inquisitiveness. Ah, that's not enough though, is it? Because it was so self-centered and the outcome was self and, and being entertained somewhat by what the Lord could do. But here is one of these prophets along with Saul. And verse 2, they're worshiping the Lord and they're fasting. Now, do they know why they're worshiping? Do they know why they're fasting? Do we know why? Well, it would seem that they're asking the Lord for the next opening in the church. The next opening for the mission of the church. What are we going to do? There isn't a scrambling together and a, a hustling together to just get the plans, get everything and the resources and saying, we're going to do this. And by the end of this year, we'll have X amount of this. We'll have an X amount of that. We'll have planted X amount of churches. No, well, they're saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? Why, why do we say that? While they were worshiping, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Amazing, isn't it? So they're listening to him. They're sensitive to his guidance and teaching. They're not coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, please. And, and there's nothing wrong in one sense doing this and in, in other ways of thinking about our Christian lives. Some things we know what we've got to do. Our duty is obvious in terms, you think, of obedience or, or what the Lord may be, may be guiding us to do in a situation. Then the scriptures will guide us. But if you're in a situation where you really don't know what to do, You'll be concerned that you do, and, and I'll be concerned that I do what the Lord wants. And in asking, there's to be an openness and a readiness to receive his guidance and his teaching. Imagine being Saul and, Bar and, and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. We say, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which 
I have called them. The Lord is moving. And they keep on fasting and praying after the Lord has spoken to them. And they lay their hands on them and they send them off. The sovereignty of the Holy Spirit, that readiness to listen. Can, can we just notice that for a, for a moment in our own lives? You ever feel that sometimes? Feel is the word. Sometimes that prompting, that urging, that moving. It's not to live by, you know, coming under an impression or, or things like that. And, you know, we can get all of that wrong. But there will no doubt be times that you can remember. Even you think of there, this is, a, this is a calling that God puts on these people. They're not putting themselves into the work of ministry. They wouldn't dare. Who would ever choose it? And that sounds maybe terrible. But when someone is called and set apart, the work they're called upon to do, to proclaim the word of God, to share the word, to go to the synagogues in, in, in uh, Cyprus and um, Antioch and Pisidia, they go to the place where the people are gathered and they open the word and they preach the word. That's the calling. The calling that God's putting on them. And Paul says as much, does he not, to the Corinthians, when he says, woe is unto me if I do not preach the gospel. He couldn't do anything else. It's not that he would choose it. It's not that you go to the career and say, anyone in, the, in their right mind would never choose to be in ministry. They would never choose it. If it's possible to run a million miles away from it, do it. That was the advice Remember a minister in Stornoway saying that, and sometimes the call would be tested. Remember someone who felt a sense of calling and younger, maybe in our Christian lives, there may be this notion of the thought and the confused feelings and emotions and passions and wanting to serve the Lord and give our lives to him. And so this, this minister would say, well, do something else first. And if the Lord is calling you, you'll hear his call. You'll hear what he's saying to you. But make sure that you test it. Make sure that you test it. Now, that, of course, is in a situation where it involves your life commitment to a certain sphere of service. And, uh, you know, as well, remember someone, that, I, don't, in, I, I don't know about the situation now, but being in a situation where someone was before a presbytery and being there, and it was, you know, there's this questions and the examination of sorts of someone's calling the presbytery meets the session meets first, and they'll assess the person who they know him best. And then there may be a recommendation to the presbytery before it goes to the board of ministry. Now, the presbytery, the person was saying about all the gifts God had given them. And maybe it wasn't right, but it got a bit under the skin, as we say. And I asked the man, what gifts has he given you? You know, because that puts us on the spot. Are we going, are we going to say, God has given me all of these gifts? Let other people say it for you. It other people that's the sense of calling that's why the church decides it's not whether the person decides if the church decides are they recognize and discern god's calling what will they discern can this person preach the word of god is this person in that place is that uh, emphasis is that reality it might not be there at first and it was said that the the the, the, the great um, Robert R. L. Dabney was a Southern Presbyterian in the 1800s, and he had, in one of a number of articles, you can still access all these works. They're great to have. Difficult reading some of his works, but what he said about the call to the ministry, so helpful, and never forgot it. We think of it about ourselves every day, never mind anyone else. But he said to the person, he said, if the person doesn't seem to have it all at first, he said, give it time. You know, people will say, oh, he doesn't this, that, or the next. That doesn't matter. The thing is to listen and see, has God called that person? And it's the church. It's not the person who says they've got the gifts or the calling. They'll come and, and, and ask the church to decide. Because through the church, they see that God is deciding. If we're spirit, you see, that's what they're doing. They're praying. They're fasting. They're self-denying. They're saying, we're not going to eat. We're not going to do the ordinary things. We're determined, Lord. We're going to pray. We're going to humble ourselves. We're going to wait on your guidance. Paul isn't saying, please send me. Barnabas isn't saying, oh, I want to go. They might have felt that. They might have been praying that. We, that we don't know for sure. But they're stopping and they're waiting for the, the Lord to guide them. And he does. And when he guides them, they go, we're told in verse 4, sent out 
by the Holy Spirit. What a calling. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy for them. Doesn't mean they'll never meet opposition. Well, that's maybe where an immature view of and by ministry or gospel work, it applies to meaning by all of us. And, and, and we think, well, ministry, what do you mean applying to all of us? Ephesians 4 says it, that the function of the teaching ministry is to equip the saints for the ministry. People sometimes think it begins and ends in a pulpit. It doesn't. It starts there. Whether it's like uh, the, the Christians who were in Berea, we're told, um, we're told about the, the Christians who were in Berea, they were more, they were more, I think honorable is the word. They were, they were more. They were more involved in the preaching of Paul because they were told that they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They didn't just take it. You've maybe enough heard, and there's been debates, maybe even arguments. And remember someone saying it, saying it to me in a. You just don't. You just let them people say this. But if you, you're asked something and you say, "Oh, but so and so said this, and so and so said that." It's as though they're the Bible when it's someone's opinion. You're allowed to have a different opinion. But where people think that because such and such a person said it so many years ago, it's final. I mean, the laws of the Medes and the Persians don't alter. But you, we've got to search the scriptures daily. These Christians were looking in the Bible and they were examining what the apostle was preaching to them to see whether what he said was actually in accord with the Bible. Not only that, the ministry and the teaching was intended to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Please read Ephesians 4. Because Paul, in talking about the unity of the Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, talks about the gifts that Christ has given the church. In light of Psalm 68, you have ascended on high and given gifts to men. Paul says, what are the gifts? Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. And it's to equip the saints. It's for... It's for the sake of the church, for the church to then carry the work on. Remember somebody saying, if we're in a vacancy, and um, they were looking forward rightly to their new minister, and the person was saying, you know, that one of the things, you know, the enthusiasm was oh, to, to be able to get these people and to reach these people and to contact these. And I said to him, that's your job. That's your job. Not to expect someone to do all of that. It's the work of the church, not the work of any one person, whoever that might be. The church is praying, the church is fasting, and the Holy Spirit comes in great blessing. And he sends Paul and Barnabas, they go on their way, verse 4 tells us, to Cyprus, they arrive at Salamis, and they proclaim, this is their calling, they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John, notice this, to assist them. John Mark, we read of him in the morning in 2 Timothy 4. Barnabas' nephew, this is him. He's called, he's called John. It's John Mark, it's the same person. We read of, because we read of him later on, um, we read of him later on, this is in verse 13, John left them. And returned to Jerusalem. That's why Paul and Barnabas felt not well. They had a disagreement. Saying a fallout isn't maybe the right way. There was a sharp disagreement over this man who was an assistant. He was helping them out. He was on the ground with them, and uh, he abandoned the mission for whatever reason. But he left, and, and that was that. But as they go on their way, empowered and led by the Holy Spirit, they face a massive challenge. Because we're told in verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, this man called Bar Jesus. Now, it's to, to remind ourselves that, that these false prophets and these magicians, just like we can hear a lot about or see a lot about witchcraft these days, although it's white and wicked and all the rest of it, there's, 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 there, you're, it's either, you're either in or out of these things. There's no, there's no middle ground where it's, where it's mild or it's innocent or it's well-intentioned. People might believe that. And their objectives may be, in their own way of thinking, positive and wholesome and enhancing to one's life. Someone might say, well, he's a magician. That's just a, just a word. It's just what he claimed to be. He pretended he was a charlatan. pretended he had powers. Well, Paul calls him in verse 10. A son of the devil. 
a son of the devil, who is um, an enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, who's making the straight paths of the Lord crooked. He is an agent of Satan to stop the gospel from having any influence over a certain man in the locale. An influential man, man called the proconsul, verse 7, Sergius Paul, is a man of intelligence. A man who wanted to hear and to learn more about this. And here is this man, and he's trying to stop it. And everywhere the gospel goes, everything you try and do for the Lord, you can be sure. Well, it was a minister who once said it, um, that when something good comes down from above, you can be sure something bad will come up from below. While we're in this world, not that Satan has the power to stop God in any shape or form, not that as it were, and sometimes you see it, whether it's in, I don't know, um, some of the children's kind of films or the animations and all of that, where there's this battle between good and evil and darkness and light and, and the outcome is uncertain. That this isn't, that there isn't any chance for Satan. In any opposition he's able to accomplish, it's because he's allowed to do it for God's reasons. Oh, he tries. He tries to stop. I see, Paul knows exactly what's going on. And when one is walking in and living in the power of the Holy Spirit, there will be a discernment. There's a discernment where you can see past appearances and see what's actually going on. Because we're told, verse 9, but Saul, who was also called Paul, notice this, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. And he saw exactly what this man was up to. And he told him. Not only that, but the Lord's judgment came on him. And he was struck, we're told, with blindness. Where he was unable to see the sun for a time. And mist and darkness fell on him. And he had to be led by the hand. And what, is, what does that lead to? Well, look at verse 12. The proconsul believes. When he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. God outwitting and outmaneuvering all the time. Satan doing everything he can to stop this man from hearing. And he's got a magician, Satan using a magician. A false prophet, an agent of the devil to convince this man to not listen to Paul and Barnabas. And what happens? Well, God judges that man and through that man being judged... This proconsul is led to faith. We should always rejoice in the Lord. And with the right hand of the mighty Lord doth ever valiantly. There's no one who can stop him. And when things in, in trying to serve the Lord in your house, at home, you maybe see it in, in work or with colleagues. And you can maybe see someone. Remember seeing this in the last congregation. Someone coming so close, it would seem. You know, remember some last congregation we were in and, and he was talking about even a situation, well, the details don't, it wouldn't be appropriate to mention exactly, but this, this person said something um, that they were delivered from doing something terrible, sinful, when the opportunity came and they, they said they had no even inclination towards the situation. They were that close. Other, before that, it would be no bother, but you know, later on. And what happened, it was someone came into that person's um, life in a way and was used by Satan. Um, now, as far as I'm aware, things haven't changed, but, but what's, you know, you think about it, I hadn't realized, I just wasn't going to say this, but um, that person who got in the way is actually no longer alive. And this person was unintentionally, unwittingly, not realizing, and they were a professing Christian that they were stopping this man from actually getting to the Lord. Now, that's humanly. We're saying that humanly. We don't, we don't know, but it can happen. But when the Lord's work, don't be discouraged, don't be put down, don't, don't despair. Any good you may seem to have managed, that's the word, managed. You know what we mean by trying and praying and waiting and the discouragements and the disappointments and someone can seem close and then, before you know it, things have just gone the other direction. Or maybe there's opposition and there's reluctance and there's resistance. These things can in their own way be a blessing. 
in the sense that it made itself be signs of God's activity in a heart. Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. You're fighting like a wild animal, Saul. Give up. The fighting might be proof of the conviction that's going on deep down. You confused maybe about yourself in that kind of way. You got a heart resistance maybe to the gospel. Do you understand it? Do you interpret it? Is it because you're afraid? Is it because you know it might happen to you? And deep down there's a, there's a pushing away. There's a reluctance. Oh, don't, re don't, don't resist. You listen to what the Lord is saying. Give your life to him. Put yourself over in his hands. You, know, you will never regret. And you'll realize, we'll all realize that uh, it's our greatest good and our ultimate best interest in life to listen to him, to give our lives to him. So what we notice happening uh, in that situation, when they move from Cyprus, verse 13 and following, they move on and uh, they come to, we're told they, they, they set sail from Paphos, came to Perga and Pamphylia. John left them. Verse 14, they come from Perga to Antioch in Pisidia, and that's somewhat northwest of Cyprus. So they've kind of come down and now they're, they're going up the other direction. That's a very poor way of but you're illustrating it. But if you look at the map later, and you'll see the direction they've taken. They're going from one place to the next. And again, we notice that in verse 14, they go to the synagogue, and they sit down. Now, we'll have to finish in, in just a moment. Maybe come back to this. But we read, read twice of them going to the synagogues. They went to synagogue in, in uh, Cyprus. They go to a synagogue in uh, Antioch in Pisidia. The synagogue was, you'd almost say, a ready-made congregation of Jews and God-fearers. God-fearers were Gentiles who weren't Jews by physical descent, but, but like Lydia, she had a, developed an interest through God's grace, an interest in the gospel and wanted to be part of the faith and so was following um, so a God-fearer. Uh, but in the, in the synagogues, it was amazing. This, with the destruction of the temple at the exile, with the Babylonian exile, um, with, the, with the believers... The, the, the Jews started doing was assembling in, in, a, in a formal setting, well, the, the synagogue. It's basically the place where people would come together. And being together, the, the word would be read, prayers would be offered, psalms would be sung. It's basically what the church of the New Testament is modeled on, patterned by. We pray, we sing, we read, the word is expounded. It's the exact same thing, except... With the Jews, it was more an exposition of the law or the prophets, and, and they were missing the whole point. And so the, Paul and his companions, when they were going throughout the world, they were going to the synagogues first, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, the word says. And so the ministry extended to God's people first, and then it extended to the Gentile world. The end of this chapter, we'll have to come back to that afterwards. But what you see is verse 15 after the, reading of the, after the reading of from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And they didn't have a clue what they were about to hear. Because Paul is going to, we're told, uh, verse 16, he stood up, motioning with his hand, and then he explains, not states, but he explains their history. And how the history is leading up and culminating in the coming of Christ. And it, that coming of Christ will culminate for the present uh, time with the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Isn't that what we read where he comes to conclude uh, and, and apply the sermon? He's saying that um, what, what God had promised to the fathers, he has fulfilled to us, their children in that he has raised, where is it, the verse, 30, verse 32, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. That's a promise. By raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. Now, we have to leave things at this point. We're hoping to go further and, and to try to think of that reference to the second psalm. There's also Psalm 16 and elsewhere referred to. God willing, we'll, we'll come back to that um, next time. Just to notice, to think, and to remember, and to be encouraged, and to be prayerful. 
over the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. His moving, people and hearts and lives, and God's control over situations where things can seem to be against and and things can appear to be hindering, but it's that amazing word of God before us. Who can be against us? Overpowered, we might feel, and uh, so vulnerable with a satanic onslaught. And you might find it through people, you might find it through situations, and you might, you know, feel that, that it's, and it is beyond your strength. But the battle isn't yours or mine, it's the Lord's. And it's to find that place of resting in him and in his power and in his blessing. And to rejoice in the meantime that he is in control over everyone and he's moving but as we're praying are we not for that moving of his power to become our experience god granted to us let's pray let's pray lord our god we are so aware of our need and we thank you that you've given us your word to address and to reassure and to promise us in our need that while the psalmist said I'm poor and needy, yet the Lord of me a care doth take. A wonderful thing it is that you are mindful of us, not just mindful as one who looks on with compassion or interest or concern, but you're the God who takes care of us. We are, you, you've said that the, the very hairs on our heads are numbered, that a sparrow doesn't fall without your notice, that there's nothing insignificant in all of creation to you. Forgive us, Lord, if we try to run on our own resources, in our own steam, as it were, or in our own strength. But help us to be like Paul and the prophets there in Antioch, waiting upon you and praying and fasting, and the Holy Spirit comes. May it be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing some verses from Psalm 90. Nine zero. This is Scottish Psalter, Psalm 90, and the page 350. A psalm of Moses, and uh, at verse 14 we can sing, uh, read from verse 14 and sing the end of the psalm. O with thy tender mercies, Lord, as early satisfy, so we rejoice shall all our days, and still be glad in thee. Psalm 90, page 350, and verse 14, O with thy tender mercies, Lord. With thy tender mercies, Lord, as early satisfied, so we rejoice shall all our days, and still Oh. Uh-huh. 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.